point and being able to uh, analyze the evidence after we understand what the model is saying. So well, once we understand what the model is saying, then we can go into the evidence and say, well, does the evidence support the model? Okay, how come it's not logical? Because you're saying it's logical to conclude universal common ancestry based on these um, homologous structures and also based on homology you know, at, at a genomic level. But if I were to take, say, Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Excel, and Microsoft Word, and I were to sequence all the lines of code in each program, I'm probably going to conclude that there's 95% similarity between the programs. But at the end of the day, that's not going to prove that they, you know, evolved from Morse code billions of years ago. I mean, that proves common design. So if there's a competing explanation in a competing model, how come we're not acknowledging that? You know, is, is common ancestry the only explanation for the homology we see? It is. Um, oh, we it is? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, let me explain. Um, we can't really uh, use things that we know are made uh, by humans and then say, wow. well, uh, this is intelligent design, so life must automatically be intelligently designed. That's uh, a little bit of an appeal to complexity well, right if there. If we see lines of code in, in Microsoft programs, such as Excel, PowerPoint, or Word, and we see lines of code in the um, ge you know genetic information system of living things, that is a valid conclusion. I mean, obviously you disagree with it, but um, these similarities do prove common design. It is a competing explanation, whether you say it's not. I, mean, so I don't understand your thinking on that. Here's, here's the reason that I do not accept the idea of a common design is that if we evoke common design, yeah. then that would mean that we would also have to ask the question of what designed the designer. Okay, if sure. Yeah. Regress solution. Well, and, obviously, we would trace it back. You know, obviously, that would be a, a, a separate who, who's the designer. You know what I mean? Like, we can conclude if we're walking through a forest and we see a painting hanging on the tree and I see nobody around and no footprints, I'm going to say, you know, did this painting come about through natural evolutionary processes or, you know, was this intelligently designed? So if I conclude it's designed, it, it doesn't mean that I know the, the designer. I may never know the designer, but it doesn't mean that we can't use that as a competing explanation. Go ahead, Kyle. But the, the problem is, is that we have to ultimately ask after that, well, who designed the designer? And eventually you're going to reach to the point where you say that the designer doesn't need a designer. And then that's just special pleading. You're, well, you're special saying pleading that because according to the according to Christian theology, uh, you know, God is the uncaused first cause. So at the end of the day, that that's is special pleading. logical uh, based uh, uh, question, obviously, if you're going to go back to who designed um, the designer, but you, it, just like in our email when I said, you know, I use the second law of thermodynamics, which is the law of increasing entropy. Um, you know, the universe is winding down. You wind it back up. Who wound it up? You know, that points to a point of least entropy, a point of creation. So, I mean, there's just so much uh, evidence that, you know, there was a creation and, um, you know, who's the creator? Sure, we can talk about that, but common design does seem like a pretty logical and valid conclusion based on the evidence. Go ahead, Kyle. So it's a it's still a special pleading argument because then you have to ask yourself what created the the designer and uh, and if we well, I don't as a Christian down, <laughs> well, if we if you boil it down the the simplest explanation with the least amount of assumptions Occam's razor is that God doesn't exist and the system itself is um, is self creating and self organizing and self-destroying. Um, okay, so you believe that, uh, you know, princes and frogs sharing a common ancestor, you think that's the, the, the most simple explanation? Because um, that sounds like a fairy tale to me, to be honest with you. It doesn't sound simple at all. Pine trees and elephants evolution. are related. That's a simple explanation. Evolution and common ancestry is the most simplest explanation with the least amount of assumptions uh, because we have the evidence to support it quite frankly. Well, I haven't seen any evidence yet. I mean, I've seen you bring up ERVs, okay? And at the end of the day, now we're even seeing that these endogenous retroviruses, uh, you know, functional ERVs would depend heavily on their position and their sequence. So if and they were positional and positioned slightly wrong, or they even had the wrong sequence, they wouldn't be functional. And yet, what do we see? We see that they're actually 
um, functional. You know, they aid in transcription in a fifth of the genome. And that's actually strong evidence that, you know, these endogenous retroviruses uh, are not actually the product of, of retroviruses. So even that as, as a big major proof is now falling apart, just that's like incorrect. all the rest of the junk DNA. Go ahead, Kyle. That's incorrect. Why is that incorrect? We're seeing um, that, that there is function and, and that they are uh, transcripted in a, in a fifth of the genome. Actually, they're even seeing function in immune responses with the section of DNA called ERVs. So oh, how's that oh wrong? they are. They are. I completely agree. Um, but, it's incorrect to, <laughs> but it's incorrect to assume that they're not actually retroviruses just because they have function. Well, function would be, a, uh, would be a prediction uh, for, because obviously viruses do not just randomly insert tens of thousands of, um, say, endogenous retroviruses, which just happen to be in exactly the right location and having exactly the right sequence to perform some valuable function. I mean, that seems like a huge leap to say that these endogenous retroviruses are evidence of universal common ancestry. I mean, how do you explain that, Kyle? Go ahead. Well, uh, Douglas Adams, the writer of Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, put it quite beautifully when he said that um, what you're saying is very similar to a, uh, a hole being filled with water and then being amazed at how well, uh, how, how good of a shape that the water fits into the hole, right? So basically what that's saying is that, um, is that, uh, these sequences, these gene sequences, insert themselves into humans or other life forms, and they can end up gaining functionality or contributing to functionality, but they can also be detrimental well, to this, the host. And, and I understand what you're saying, obviously. It, but the thing is, these ERVs could also be um, some type of weakness in the system. But I think the, the, the fact that we are seeing, um, you know, functionality in it and obviously you know you, you guys got to develop you know a, a type of story that they could become functional you know the the key word is could or might but there's also cell processes and you would know this based on your education um, that are designed to weed out harmful uh, or viral infected genes which is called what a apoptosis is that how you say it so after millions of years why do we still have according to uh, you so many viral infected ERVs because shouldn't this process have ridden them long ago? Because apparently it's not doing it at all. I mean, help me understand. No, no. Um, so uh, a good example. So this. So ERVs are just a part of gene flow, and um, around like ten percent of our genome is made up of viral DNA, and so it's just a common thing. Um, we can look at uh, another example of, of uh, beneficiality to gene flow is looking at sweet potatoes. Around 8,000 years ago, agrobacterium infested uh, sweet potatoes and provided them a plasmid. A plasmid is a circular form of DNA that is able to uh, pass on through conjugation. And agrobacterium is one of the few, the very few, um, bacteria that is able to uh, conjugate with a eukaryote. Usually they cannot conjugate with eukaryotes, but agrobacterium can. Uh, it evolved the ability to, uh, to do this to, um, to plants, and it would create uh, these tumors on plants for uh, additional food sources. Um, but it did it to uh, sweet potatoes, and it modified sweet potatoes to be sweet potatoes that we see today. And so it modified the traits and, the, and it sh was shown to be beneficial for the, um, the uh, sweet potato. And it, so it incorporated the genes from agrobacterium into the sweet potato and the sweet potato benefited from it, right? Well, that's what viruses can do. Not all viruses are going to just be strictly detrimental to the survival of a, of a species. They well, can't. I understand that obviously not all of them will, but with the amounts that we see in the genome that you're um, saying is, um, you know, based on 
uh, retroviruses implanting their genetic material, we should still see a lot less based on that process known as apoptosis. And the fact that we see functionality in it, uh, it's definitely consistent. I mean, whether you have an explanation or not, whether it's a rescue device or whatever it is, I mean, it's still consistent with my model. And the debate today is which model is best. And, you know, I think through our discussion, you know, it, it's been shown that, you know, there are limits. Uh, it's very, very hard for the evolutionists to explain even one information adding mutation. Um, it, it's very hard to explain away genetic entropy, especially, you know, in higher genomes. So at the end of the day, we'll leave it up to, to the viewers to watch and, and conclude. Um, We've been going at it for about a half an hour. I'll leave you with the last word. Take a couple minutes, summarize yourself, um, your position, uh, tell us why you believe that you know your model is more superior, and um, we'll call it a day for now. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Well, well, to finish up, I will say that um, I did cover uh, adding information, uh, which is addition mutations and duplication mutations, both add information. Um, I did cover the idea of uh, being able to change and evolve and explain that in order for an organism to, to evolve uh, beyond its limits, we have to understand their life histories. So we wouldn't get cats the size of um, elephants because the bone structures are important um, and, uh, and the bone density is important if you end up increasing to, to certain sizes uh, because you need to be able to survive gravity and stuff like that. Um, and that if you actually look at uh, the models used, which one is used in, in industry? And that's really the gold standard right there. Which model is used in industry? Call up any molecular biology lab, any biotechnology lab, any bioinformatics um, uh, lab, and ask them, do you look at a creationist model to do your work, or do you assume a evolutionary model to do your work, and how useful is that evolutionary model when you are actually doing your work. And I bet you that every single time they are using the evolutionary model and understanding evolution and change in species in order to do their work. And no one is using the creationist model except to sell videos to uh, religious evangelicals.